Good morning. Good morning, Excellencies, esteemed guests, industry leaders, and innovators, colleagues, and friends of IRENA. My name is Roland Rösch, and I am delighted to stand before you today as the director of the Innovation and Technology Center to inaugurate the fourth IRENA Innovation Week right here in the Bundeskunsthalle, close to IRENA's office, just five minutes down the way from here, and close also to the UN Tower in the beautiful city of Bonn. This year's our innovation compass points towards a topic of utmost significance. Renewable solutions to decarbonize end use sectors. As we delve into the depths of this theme, let's acknowledge the stark reality. To truly meet the world's climate commitments, we will need three times more electrical energy globally than we currently use. A major milestone for IRENA in the journey to overcome this challenge is the recent launch of the IRENA Innovation Landscape Report on Smart Electrification. This is not just another report with insights from over 200 global leading expert, experts, of whom of them grace us with their presence here today. It embodies, so the report embodies a holistic systemic expert approach to innovation, which will be discussed in many of the upcoming sessions of the Innovation Week 2023. What this report eloquently conveys is the vast economic opportunity that uh, lying in smart decarbonization. Moreover, it underscores the immense potential in public savings for the technical implementation uh, of the global energy transition. As we look at the next four days, let me give you a glimpse of what awaits us. We have an exciting program with world-class experts lined up in the sessions to come. Today, our discussion will revolve around the direct electrification of end-use sectors. Following this inaugural session, prepare to dive into sessions shedding light on the transformative impact of electrification on the power sector. Moreover, we'll explore innovations in electrifying road transport, residential heating, and cooling. Tomorrow promises yet another captivating narrative on indirect electrification for sectors where direct electrification isn't feasible. We expect robust dialogues on industries such as iron and steel, chemicals, petrochemicals, shipping, and aviation. The role of green hydrogen and the related technologies in this context will be central to the discussion in these sessions. On Wednesday and Thursday, I invite you all to join us at the IITC office building, just a short walk away from here, for immersive workshops on various, on various innovation subjects and uh, also of an IRENA collaborative framework, which will be delivered here, um, let's say, as a, the collaborative framework of high shares for renewables. But allow me to stress, this event is not solely about imbibing knowledge, it's about forging connections, the conversations, collaborations, and networks that emerge from these corridors will be pivotal in propelling our shared mission forward. I urge you to make the most out of these inter inter intervaluable interactions. Before now moving ahead, I wish to convey our heartfelt gratitude to all the partner organizations who have, stu have stood with us this year. Your unwavering support and dedication to IRENA's mission have truly made this week possible. And here you, you see the logos of all these partners that have contributed to this uh, Innovation Week and the, the partners that will be also in the sessions of this Innovation Week 23. Great thanks to all partners that contributed to the Smart Electrification IRENA Landscape Report and to, to, to this IRENA, IRENA Innovation Week 2023. I thank you very much all. 
And now let me introduce our esteemed master of ceremonies, Felicia Jackson. She is a stalwart in sustainable growth. Felicia is the editor of Sustainable Growth Voice, an experienced writer and editor, academic and former entrepreneur herself. Her distinguished work has adorned publications in leading magazines like Times and Forbes. She is not a stranger to the Innovation Week, having also served as our Master of Ceremonies for the second Innovation Week in 2018. We are thrilled to have Alicia here to go through with us the fourth, to lead us and guide us through the fourth Innovation Week 2023. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm filled with anticipation and excitement for the insight and innovations this week holds. Let us embark on this journey together. With that, I now hand over to the, the stage to Felicia. Thank you all very much to be here with us for Innovation Week 2023. Felicia. kind introduction, Roland. It's very exciting to be back and part of Innovation Week. I think we all know the challenges we face, but actually the combination of innovation with policy expertise and finance is fundamental to the transformation of the way in which we live our lives. And we've got an opportunity this week to actually be part of making that happen. So my job this week is logistics. I'm here to make sure that everything runs smoothly and any changes or any questions you might have, I'm here to answer them. So one of the first things is there's a slight change to this morning's agenda because Malik Batunga hasn't been able to make it, I'm afraid. So we don't have her presentation this morning. Um, over to my right, your left, is Irene Martins, who's a visual harvester. So she's actually going to be turning the key messages of today's conversations into images that we'll be able to see and record and pay attention to afterwards. Every session of the event is going to be recorded and will be available afterwards. The really important issues, Wi-Fi. It's completely open, you just log on. Lavatories, you go outside, there's some upstairs, downstairs, and where coffee is, if you go out, you turn left and left again, there's some lavatories there, but you walk through, and there's a coffee place where we'll be having coffee in the morning and lunch, and then a marquee outside. Um, there's a meeting application. You were all sent an email on Friday, so if you log on, you'll have your own personalized uh, network application where you can find out who else is here and arrange to meet people. Um, there will be events later today in the lounge, which is upstairs, but I'll always warn you ahead of time if anywhere's gonna be different. This morning and first thing this afternoon will be in here. All the events for the next couple of days will be in this building as Roland has mentioned, so I don't need to run over that again. Um, please wear your badge at all times. So you can't get in anywhere if you're not wearing your badge. It's one of the most important things. This is what you need. Please no food and drink in the conference rooms if, if you can possibly avoid it. Um, we do have a thing called Slido where you can ask questions in certain sessions. It's not an issue for the keynotes this morning, but you literally just log on. What I'm gonna do now is introduce you to the man of the hour. Um, Francesco La Camera is the Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agency. He's been in charge of steering it through the choppy waters of transition since 2019. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing what he's got to say. Francesco. Good morning, and uh, as I come from Abu Dhabi, I think I have to say also salam alaikum to all uh, of you. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here in Bonn for the fourth Arena Innovation Week 2023. The conference is themed, themed Renewable Solution to Decarbonize and Use Sectors. And I wish to put strong emphasis on the significance of solutions. 
Arena's World Energy Transition Outlooks calls for tripling annual renewable power addition to 1,000 gigawatts on average until 2030 to keep 1.5 Celsius climate target within reach. And we are pleased to witness a growing global consensus around the level of ambition and targets for the energy transition. As you know, as you know G7 took our number on solar and wind ambition in their uh, final uh, communique. As uh, recently the G20 leaders in a landmark move endorsed Arena's recommendation. And if I can say more historically, the Africa Summit also went in this direction. All their statements align with Arena's call for 11 terawatts of renewable power capacity by 2030, backed by 4 trillion of added US dollar in annual investment over the same period. It is now clear to everyone where we must steer our efforts to achieve our goal. And we have seen also in the recent week in New York how this messaging is passing through. So, if there's a growing consensus on this, the pressing question remains, how do we get there as soon as possible? You know that ARENA is trying to let pass a narrative they say very clear that if you want to have more renewables into the grids, we have to overcome three existing barriers. One is the physical infrastructure. How you can uh, benefit of the tremendous potential for renewable energy of Africa, the most important powerhouse for green hydrogen, if we don't have uh, the physical infrastructure that allow them to trade and transmit the energy they can produce. And this applies also for the Southeast Asia. And how we can do this happening if we don't have a legal environment, policy measures that are designed the market in a way that more renewables are encouraged to come. The energy transition is not just a question of the supply side, it's also a question of the demand side. We have to build markets for hydrogen, markets for more renewables into the grid. And how we can do this if still our institutions are based on, on the past, on uh, managing an old and centralized energy system and not moving to a new decentralized one. And uh, on all these three pillars, innovation is instrumental. We have most of the needed technologies at our disposal, but their commercialization and scaling up require ongoing innovation in business models, regulation, and financial instruments. Moreover, some sectors, particularly those referred, refer as art to a bad sector, such as industries, shipping and aviation, still need technologies in early development stage. Progress in technology innovation is imperative. Since its establishment 12 years ago, ARENA has been at the forefront, conducting cutting edge analysis and informing member countries on the latest innovation that can transform the energy sector. In 2016, we had the first ARENA Innovation Week, and the positive response from all stakeholders has since established it as our flagship conference. At this fourth edition of the Innovation Week, with the support of our partners organization and diverse stakeholders, as uh, Roland has mentioned, we delve into innovative solutions tailored to address challenges posed by these difficult sectors. We do with a firm belief that this solution can put us back on track to achieve a just and fair energy transition. In June, we launched together with my dear friends, the EU Commissioner Kadri Simpson, ARENA's flagship publication, Innovation Landscape Report on Smart Electrification. The report equipped decision makers with a toolbox, 
still books of 100 innovations that countries can incorporate into tailored national strategies to carbonize and use sector. We believe that decision makers must adopt a systemic approach that combine innovation in technology and infrastructure with those in market design and regulation, system planning and operation and business model. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, before I conclude, I wish to extend a warm welcome to our higher level guests who have graciously joined our opening panel this morning. I refer to the European Commissioner, Mrs. Kadri Simpson, the African Union Commissioner, Ms. Amani Abu Zaid, Mr. Philip Henry, Vice President of Walloon, Mr. Caleb Udui, Minister of Finance of Palau, and Mr. Siva Gunda, Vice Chair of the California Energy Commission. Naturally, I also wish to thank Felicia for his work today with us, and Roland for his introduction. And I also thank Elizabeth, that is going to moderate the panel. Your presence all of today in Bonn, your continued support for Irina's work, and your dedicated efforts as voice of influence reflect your unwavering commitment to our common goal, making this energy transition a reality. With this conference, Irina aims to disseminate the knowledge and best practice that will empower us to transform our energy landscape. The objective is to highlight innovation that offer cost-effective means to drive economic growth, enhance energy security, and mitigate the impact of climate change. To conclude, I wish to underscore that the outcome of this conference will be an important milestone on the road to COP28, where we all hope having success. I trust this conference will not only bring us nearer to our mutual goals, but also remind us of our collective responsibility. ARENA remains committed to fostering innovation in the energy sector. I wish us all inspiring discussion and practical insight from the four days conference. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Francesco. Could I ask Dr. Nawal al hassani to come and give your keynote speech? Dr. al hassani is the permanent representative of the UAE to IRENA, and as you can see from her bio, has got an incredible range of experience. What I find most exciting is that spread of experience between renewable energy through her work as the Executive Director of Sustainability at Mazdar, and the fact that she's an advisor to the COP28 UAE Advisory Committee, and the Vice Chair of the Global Council for the Sustainable Development Goals. That combination of sustainability, development, energy, it's phenomenal. Dr. Al Hazani? Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that we brought with us a little bit more sun here to Bonn today. So thank you, and thank you uh, for Irina for inviting me for this amazing platform. It is an actual and great pleasure and honor for me to be here with you today at the Irina Innovation Week and to discuss with you the experts in this field the innovation measures necessary to accelerate energy transition, uh, to accelerate energy transition in a fair and efficient way. Ladies and gentlemen, earlier this month, the UNFCCC published a synthesis report and an initial summary of the ongoing technical dialogue on the global stock take ahead of COP28 in Dubai later this year. Seven years have passed since the Global North and Global South agreed on the Paris Agreement with an overarching goal to hold increasing in, to, the increasing in the global average temperature well below two degrees above pre-industrial level and pursue effort to limit 
the temperature increased to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. However, to limit global warming to, one, to, warming to 1.5 degrees, greenhouse gas emissions must peak before 2025 at the latest and decline 43% by 2030. The UNFCCC synthesis report already gave a glimpse of what we can expect in November. And most of us already know and expect that we are far behind achieving this goal and that the current course of policies and plans are far from sufficient to close the gap. Therefore, as the presidency of COP28, the UAE aims to strengthen ambition and to transform them into actions by all parties and stakeholders. Action, ladies and gentlemen, is key. Innovation is also a very important key. Due to Irina's excellent work in analyzing the current situation in the world energy transition outlook and providing pathways for action, we actually know what we need to do. In principle, we know that we have to accelerate the deployment of existing, mature, and well-proven technologies. The majority of the CO2 abatement requirements come from technologies that are already commercially demonstrated today. This includes either, technolo uh, either uh, technology that is technically and commercially mature and has reached proof of stability, such as solar PV or wind power solutions, or technology that is on the market but requires further system integration and or support to be competitive, or through technology that is, as of now, commercially demonstrated but not fully deployed at scale. At the same time, there is also an urgent need to accelerate innovation and commercialization of early stage technologies, technology that is proven in prototypes or currently at proof of concept in laboratories which need to be pushed forward. On a global perspective, we know what we have to do. Broken down on a national level, challenges of deployment and promotions of technology and system integration are not an easy undertaking. Decisions need to be made soon on the right abatement strategy, having in mind a just transition. One solution does not fit all. And that's why I welcome Irina's new toolbox, Innovation Landscape for Smart Electrification, which guides countries through the labyrinth of solutions on to the optimal strategy, uh, strategies implementation of innovative solutions, taking into account their own situations, resources, and need for their own future. Ladies and gentlemen, the UAE, as the COP28 presidency, is currently structuring COP28, but besides the negotiation process is guided by our vision that COP28 will act as a catalyst, mobilizing the action tech ecosystem and leveraging technologies and innovation to drive the de development and deployment of climate solutions to bring the world back to 1.5 degrees trajectory. This will require a transformation greater than the industrial revolution. With the objective of accelerating climate action, the COP28 presidency decided to establish the technology and innovation hub at the Green Zone, which will spotlight technologies and solutions from across the world with real potential for impact and scaling. The themes of technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship were run throughout COP28 and cut across all thematic days. The hub will act as a catalyst for enabling government, businesses, and civil society to collaborate and leverage technologies and innovative solutions to address the most pressing sustainability challenges of our time. The Technology and Innovation Hub will contain a dedicated stage with two weeks of curated programming that explores the, the enabling role of technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship in tackling climate change. Outcomes of this discussion and outcomes of the discussion of the Irene Innovation Week will also be discussed at the, at the Technology and Innovation Hub, and I invite you all to be part of this dialogue. I'm looking forward to the next days, and I am learned from you and our excellent speakers how we can accelerate this transition. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Hassani. Um, I'd now like to invite Elizabeth Press to come up to the stage. She is the Director of Planning and Programme Support for IRENA and is going to be moderating our high-level panel discussion on innovation in the energy transition. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Felicia. And uh, can I actually invite our panelists straight to the podium so that we can start our discussion? Uh, it's my pleasure to invite Commissioner uh, Amani Abazid, uh, who is Commissioner of Infrastructure and Energy from Africa and the Commission. Commissioner Kadri Simpson, uh, who covers energy in the European Commission. Uh, Philip Ampi, a Vice President and Minister for Climate, Energy, Mobility, Infrastructure of the Low Region of Belgium. Minister Khaled Udori, Minister of Finance from the Government of Palau, and Commissioner Sivagunda from California. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, I have a little bit of an echo. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, good morning and welcome, welcome to the stage. Uh, we have a group of policymakers from diverse regions, diverse portfolios, and uh, uh, diverse uh, uh, backgrounds. Uh, I, you know, last week I was in one of the events, and uh, um, it was around offshore wind, and one of the CEOs said, um, policymakers, bureaucrats will save the world. And it reflects on the necessity of policy making to accelerate transition in line with the climate imperatives and what needs to happen up to 2030. So um, innovation will pay, play a huge role in uh, how we advance, how fast we actually move from the system we have. We know this is not a fuel replacement. This is a different, different system. This is a systemic shift, a structural shift at all levels. You have a lot to do. Let me start with Commissioner um, Abu Zaid. You have a portfolio, interesting portfolio. You have infrastructure and energy, and you have a digitalization. So innovation is the backbone of what you do. But you're on the continent that has to do two things at a time. It has to grow, and has to grow in a way that's compatible with climate uh, imperatives. So can you reflect a little bit on the innovation in Africa? What can you learn from the others, but what can you do yourself and show to others? Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, allow me at the outset to uh, thank uh, Irina and my dear friend uh, Francesco for inviting me to this important event. To also, I'm honored to be uh, I'm, I'm sitting on this panel with the esteemed uh, panelists. Uh, very happy to be in Bonn, and uh, uh, Bonn is one of the cities of my uh, teenagehood. I was here when, when it was still the capital of Germany, so that's, that to tell you how old I am. It's not <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mentioned Bonn because we do also have to remember, I hope if you haven't been, that you would have the time to visit Beethoven's house. And Beethoven was a major innovator. Uh, it's not just about the music, the fantastic music that we still enjoy, but he was a major innovator when it comes to um, uh, to the Minuet, to the Concerto, and even to Symphony. And Bonn continued this tradition of innovation through fantastic and major research institutes and technology institutes here in, in Bonn. I'm promoting Bonn for those <laughs> who don't know. So just to tell you that we are really in the, in the right city uh, for this innovation week. Um, yes, I do have uh, several sectors in my portfolio, transport, all kinds of transport, energy, and digitalization. And I'm lucky to have those because this is very relevant to what we're going to, uh, to say and see uh, during this week. All these sectors consume energy and produce energy, uh, and they are very much intertwined. And what we see in the, uh, uh, what we often see in conversations about energy that people focus on energy generation and they do not you know take it further uh, energy transmission the last mile uh, how is this impacting transport transport you know 25 percent or 30 percent of our uh, fuels uh, go to uh, transport and then how digitalization this marvelous tool is making things happen in ways that we did not know before and for us in Africa, this is very important. For those who don't know, we, we do have, of course, 
countries that did very well when it comes to energy in general. One of them is my, my own country, Egypt, and you know how it transformed into surplus, you know, the state of the art smart grid that we're having. But also, Africa is a continent where more than half of the population do not have access to electricity. It's the continent when almost one billion persons do not have access to clean cooking. And what we have learned, uh, thanks to uh, digitalization over, over the last 10, 15 years, one is that Africa very capable and adopts new technologies very uh, uh, well and very fast, more than any other region in the world. And we, we adopted digitalization in ways you know, that opened even digitalization for other regions in the world. Two, that it allows us to uh, bypass that traditional path for whatever sector, and then you know make a jump into the latest and the best in in different ways. So we are not, and we are not seeking to to follow even for electrification or clean protein or energy in general. We we cannot still use the same old way uh, because this is not going to help us do this major shift. Uh, so digitalization is a major enabler for us, and I'm looking forward, we are all looking forward to the outcome of this and many other uh, events talk about innovation in order to help us uh, do this breakthrough uh, when it comes to our energy. Uh, this, of course, I mean, goes also with the regulation. We were, our regulation on the continent, we are working on them as African Union in order to make them regulations for the future. And I don't think I'm speaking only for Africa. Most of the regulations when it comes to energy are ones of the past. And regulators in any sector, no offense, are known not to be really in line with innovation. So, uh, but this is the time really to, to make this uh, shift into a, a regulation that looks into the future, especially that the world is at a very critical point and the crossroads. So, all of us, we really need to get out of uh, our comfort zone and do what's necessary. Sorry? And no, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Uh, politicians are not going to, uh, to save the world. The ones who are going to save the world are the young people. And that's why I'm hopeful for our continent. 70% of our continent are young people, and they are the ones who are going to save not only Africa, but the world. And, I'm, and, I, and I am determined. And I know <laughs> what I'm talking about. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. And we were going to have a quite dynamic conversation around this because you actually pulled out several points, very important points: the demand, demand side, uh, the the regulatory side, um, the sectoral shifts, uh, and uh, and many other topics that you that, that you raised. Can I just ask my Director General to also come here because we would like to pull you into conversation? Uh, can you come to the stage, please, Director General? <laughs> Because you cannot get away with <laughs> sitting in the audience. Um, and, uh, and I will turn now, uh, let, let's stay on the regulation, because we have a Commissioner Simpson here, and the EU has done phenomenal things in, in innovating the regulatory side and uh, accelerating the move away from fossil fuels. Can, can you explain to us a little bit how do you see this cost benefit uh, of this shift, and where are the tricky bits? What can we learn from your experience? Thank you, Elizabeth, for that question. But before I will reply, um, I want to also thank Irina, and especially um, due to the fact that you decided to present your innovation landscape report um, back in June in our premises. And uh, it was possible to see that in this report you also uh, highlighted many good examples from European member states. And uh, that is a sign that we have financed a lot of research and innovation. And uh, my dear colleague, Dr. Abu Said, um, mentioned that we have to come out from the comfort zone. Well, everybody knows that Europe was pushed out of comfort zone last year when we faced our biggest energy crisis. And, and um, then we knew that everything that we were preparing for was necessary. Um, but we just had to accelerate um, uh, all the uh, procedures. And um, since last year, we have opened all our energy-related legislation um, um, and uh, for one purpose, to accelerate green transition. 
So already in 2019, when we presented our Green Deal strategy, it was uh, not only about our climate targets, but also about uh, uh, our growth. And uh, now we know that there are three major work streams that we need to do. First of them is to, um, to accelerate um, homegrown renewables deployment. So we are still importing fossil fuels. Uh, more than 90% of the natural gas and oil that in Europe we do consume is imported. And, uh, and by the end of this uh, decade, we plan to cover 42.5% of our energy consumption with renewables. For that, we, need, um, we first need to, well, uh, to grant permits for these new installations. And there, we actually can show a innovation because the permit granting process as such uh, might be very lengthy, but uh, if our member states, if our uh, um, regulators will, um, will also um, um, require innovation in the, in the way that, that administration permit applications will be um, um, conducted, uh, that can be significantly faster. Second, we opened our renewable energy directive to, well, to bring some of the hard to abate sectors out from comfort zone. So transport, industry, they know now that by the end of the decade there are certain shares of hydrogen that has to be covered by renewable hydrogen. So it was a constant chicken and egg question. And, uh, and now uh, the hydrogen producers do know that there will be market demand in Europe. And the third, um, we have put forward a new electricity market design proposal. Um, and this um, also includes several key components for, uh, for speeding up innovation. Um, it introduces new support mechanisms to promote flexibility solutions, such as uh, storage and demand side um, uh, measures. It also uh, promotes uh, market for renewables um, by granting them very favorable contracting schemes, like power purchase agreements or contracts for different schemes. And, and last but not least, um, uh, we are updating network tariffs to attract uh, more investments into our grids because indeed um, the biggest bottleneck for European um, energy transition right now is not any more permitting, it is uh, our grid infrastructure that needs uh, uh, major investments. And finally, um, we presented Net Zero Industry Act because uh, there are several promising uh, clean tech uh, sectors uh, and we don't want to start um, um, importing all the necessary um, technology from third countries. So we just uh, got rid of the dangerous dependency on uh, Russian fossil gas. We don't want to replace it with another dependency. And that's why there are uh, 10 um, promising and already market-ready technologies that, uh, that we will um, um, bring back partially the production we will bring back to Europe. And by doing so, um, it doesn't mean that, uh, that, uh, that uh, the other producers will lose their market because, as I was mentioning earlier, we have to triple our wind production by the end of the decade, so there is a market share available for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, let us go to the other side of the world, to Minister Udo. I remember, in, I think it was 2012, when we first started working with Palau, and there was a big debate whether 20% of renewables, whether the grid can sustain 20% of renewables. So I wonder, a decade later, how do you see, I mean, you are the forefront of climate change. Uh, you're facing extreme weather events. How is the energy system uh, so, uh, defending itself against those? And have you moved with renewables uh, since the time that we first started working with you? Yes. Thank you. This is working. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, also, let me uh, extend my uh, greetings to everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to participate to the organizers and the host for this event. Uh, and thank you for that question. Uh, 2012 was a very different time for Palau and, and also for the region. And uh, we did uh, launch very ambitious targets for our nationally determined contribution, which we still continue to have today. Fortunately, we have been successful very recently in securing an uh, independent power producer agreement uh, with a private company, our first uh, uh, IPP. 
and second, uh, PPP uh, for our country. So that accompanied with several donor-sponsored uh, PV installations, mostly at car parks, uh, and also uh, some private investment sponsored by Japan, the, uh, JFJCM. Uh, these uh, investments in Plav brought our renewable energy mostly through uh, solar uh, PV uh, to uh, install capacity of about 27% is our current estimate. So we have reached our target a bit late because of COVID, uh, but we believe that we will be able to stick to our plan of going 45% by uh, 2025. Uh, with the attention that we're getting from donors who uh, are looking at the potential that we have to reach that target. And our president has recently issued a statement uh, that he'd like us to go 100% by 2032. So we're still uh, taking a very ambitious track uh, towards achieving uh, energy transformation transition for our country, which is extremely important at this time because of the energy crisis that we're experiencing and challenges uh, due to disruptions in the global supply chain, where we're seeing inflation as high as 14% recently. And that, uh, for a country that wages have, real, real incomes have been falling, uh, is a very big challenge politically. And without the, uh, uh, the freedom to look at innovation uh, with, for our uh, leaders, uh, the policymakers, uh, it's very difficult to to chase innovation, especially in the energy sector, which is a key part to our economic development strategy. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, uh, it's really impressive to hear how far you have got come and, uh, and looking at 100%. Uh, uh, I guess there is a, a challenge for innovation for all of us uh, to be with you on this path. Uh, let us go subnational. Uh, so let me turn to Minister Ari. Uh, so, uh, Minister, uh, Commissioner Simpson was talking about the regulatory structure at the, at the EU level, and then we have national level, and then it cascades out to subnational. How do you reconcile all these levels of policy and regulation to advance what you need to advance in your region? Yes, it's an, an important question. I also uh, would like to, to thank you, of course, for the organization and Irena for this, this organization of the week. Innovation is very, very uh, important and we are, of course, uh, with a, a huge challenge in front of us with the transition, with the climate crisis, and it's very, very important we, we go further. So, with, coming back to your question, uh, Belgium is a little like, um, if I dare, Mrs. the Commissioner, a little Europe, because you have different governments inside. Uh, we have um, only uh, 11 million inhabitants, uh, but we have uh, seven different governments, regional, uh, community governments, and the federal one. And no one is the boss of the others. Each one has uh, several matters and several uh, geographical uh, areas. And we have to discuss, which is uh, very important because, um, of course, there is a common interest to uh, cooperate, to have a discussion and to find ways. Uh, but sometimes it works very well. Sometimes it's a little more complicated. So it's uh, necessary to to organize very well the, the rules, uh, to know uh, who is uh, responsible for what, uh, what will happen if we don't agree, uh, what will be uh, the manner to, to solve the, the difficulties, and so on. So I, I think it works finally not so bad, and I think also Belgians are well known for, uh, for discussing, for negotiating, for compromises, and it's necessary to, to find solutions. And perhaps I would say what is very um, particular in this situation is that we have to work at two different extreme scales. We have to work on the, the continental scale uh, because we, we, we have interconnection uh, on, in the energy necessary. <clears throat> we have um, productions in some countries, in other countries, if you have solar, wind, and so on. And we have also at the same time a decentralization in the production of energy. So you have also to, to manage it very locally with the communities, with the, the absorption of the, con, of the productions very located. So the combination of two, two, two different, those two different scales, uh, it's something uh, difficult, I think. 
Thank, thank you, Minister. Let us go to the other side of the world, you know, another subnational. <laughs> so California, famous for innovation at all different levels. We were just listening to a governor in New York, a very impressive ambition for phasing out fossil fuel fully, but you also are the brunt of a climate change. So can you talk to us a little bit about this demand side and how you're merging the two? What is your strategy along that? Yes, absolutely. Good morning, everybody. And Again, thank you so much, uh, Irina, for uh, both organizing this wonderful event, but also inviting California to be a part of this wonderful panel here. Um, had a chance to walk around the riverside. Um, beautiful. What a wonderful place to be here. Um, so just uh, starting off at a very high level, um, California's climate policy um, is essentially uh, predicated on electrifying a large swath of the economy and then underpinning that with clean electric grid that's reliable but also affordable. So that's kind of the basic climate uh, agenda. So when we think through that, um, so we have to rapidly electrify. So we are looking at increasing the electric demand uh, two, two and a half times. Um, so we're kind of going up really rapidly. So whether it's um, transportation electrification, building electrification, industrial, commercial, so on. So we have a large amount of demand. We know it's coming. We're also looking at uh, creating some of those molecules, uh, you know, green hydrogen, also from the clean electric grid. So you're talking about adding a lot of demand to the grid. Then comes the question on how do you plan for an extremely high demand um, that's going to be two, three times by 2035, 2040, um, that's still reliable. Um, so uh, in, in the face of what you talked about, climate change. So one of the things we are talking about in California is climate change is making it difficult to find climate change, right? So you are in the situation um, where we have extreme temperatures, um, fire risk, as well as drought, right? So. When we look at our electric uh, demand and then overall energy planning, so the, the fundamental premise is a three part. So you wanna make sure demand flexibility or the demand side is gonna be as optimized and grid friendly as possible to begin with. And then you kind of move into a rapid acceleration of deployment, uh, whether it's clean energy resources, transmission, distribution upgrades and so on. Um, and then finally, this is the third component of the evolution since 2020. And the reason why I talk about 2020 is in 2020, September, in August 14th and 15th, we had our first blackouts in California in 20 years. And the blackouts came because of lack of enough supply on the electric grid. That's the first time it happened to us in 20 years. And primarily because the temperature has departed so far outside the bounds of what we plan for. So looking at year after year, we're looking at temperature one departing for a very few hours, whether it's you know, 10, 15, 20 hours, we have this 10,000, 15,000 megawatt of additional load. And, and, that's, and you just can't build that much for just 10, 10 hours. Um, the second thing that's happening is when we look at the green, you know, clean energy production, the hydro varies year to year significantly. So in 2021, for example, we had a drought year where some of our reservoirs went to zero production for the first time in, since they were ever built, like for 30, 40 years. So you're looking at um, the drought de decreasing the hydro production. You have demand kind of fluctuating very highly. So what we talked about now is creating the third paradigm of planning, which we are calling the strategic reserve or planning for extreme weathers. So when we talk about the strategic reserve, you're talking about having five to 10,000 megawatts of potential resources or demand flexibility for those you know, 50 hours of the year. So that's where you know, the demand flexibility comes into place um, as a huge part. So whether you're looking at large industrial loads or whether you're looking at transportation. Um, so for example, on transportation, by 2030, we're looking at about having seven million EVs on the road. And that will translate to 60,000 megawatts of instant load reduction possibility on the wheels. So what we're looking at is how do you then seamlessly take that demand, not only to make it a good citizen of the grid before we start building, but on the, on the other end, on the extreme events, how do you make sure that demand could be responsive to keep the lights on? I think one of the things um, the African Union Commissioner mentioned, as we move towards digitization and renewables, 
historically, we had a very, very easy way to like forecast demand, and then supply was good, and we could just have what we call perfect resources, right? So whether it's uh, thermal resources coming from coal or gas, you had these resources that could ramp up, dispatch very firmly whenever you need. But with renewables, what's happening is you need to start forecasting supply and match your demand to it. So if we can, if we can now be a little bit more flexible, because everybody had the round of, uh, of first remarks, and I would like us to go into this uh, flexibility discussion a little bit, if, if we can. Um, so we're moving into, into sectoral shifts. We're moving from electricity defined in the very narrow terms to go into other sectors, but we're really not structured for that because the portfolios are different. Um, there is a lot of innovation to be done at a, at a, at a policy level as well. Uh, so Commissioner Abu Zaid, maybe I can go back to you. When you go into the end use side of it, how do you, how do you reconcile this, uh, this split that is not necessarily between the end use and the electricity, that is not necessarily natural to our systems right now? Well, uh, let me talk more, uh, how would I say, holistically, I mean, uh, for us, I mean, it's not, it's not really, because of, of the big needs that we are having, there's no size fit all. So we have to use many, many solutions, and many of them are tailored. So what is what we are thinking of, what we are implementing, for instance, for a to a, into a remote village is not necessarily what is happening or what should be happening in an industrial zone. So things like the distributed energy, things like mini grids and off-grid solutions, uh, uh, with the pay as you go, you know, using the, the mobile, and uh, now, I mean, the solar, I mean, here we talk about innovation, these mini solar kits are helping in that uh, sense. We are moving, uh, uh, when we go into an uh, uh, industrial zone, I mean, and then we talk about grids and the, the smart grids and the generation. Uh, the base load differs from one region to another. Eastern Africa, they have a fantastic resource that we have been funding together with many partners, many of them here, including Germany. To, uh, uh, to exploit you know, the geothermal energy that serves as, as base load for, for the region. Uh, others you know, are using natural gas. We're seeing also small nuclear reactors because we're talking clean energy as well. But uh, I don't think the discussion evolved also uh, uh, or touched upon efficiency. Because it's not only about energy or distribution or even the last mile. Uh, we are making very, very big efforts on the continent for energy efficiency, uh, to use and reuse what we already have and to better use it. And again, we, what we're seeing is that there's lots of innovation in that space, and we want to harness it for, for our continent to make use of what we have, uh, but better, and to, uh, which allow us also to extend you know, the benefits of, uh, of electrification or of energy in general, to other, uh, uh, to, to the larger population. Um, I'm using this maybe be, being here also to, because I spoke more on the narrative side or the things that are not happening on the continent, but I wanted to remind everyone, including myself, that there are great things also are happening on the continent. Our continent in a matter of months, uh, we have nine countries that are producing green hydrogen. Uh, some of our green hydrogen is already, you know, fueling vessels, uh, uh, European vessels going around the world. We have uh, four or five countries uh, about to produce also sustainable aviation fuel, which is, which is fantastic. So uh, uh, this is to emphasize the point I said, I mean, that we adopt uh, energy very quickly, but uh, what we, as the African Union, because we are working with our countries in that space, is that innovation, whether in energy, efficiency, uh, pro production generation, or these new energies, want to make sure that locally there are you know, the value chains for these uh, uh, new uh, uh, breakthroughs in you know, energy that are developed locally, uh, and that they are used locally, not all for export because uh, there's lots of export growing, or lots of demand outside the continent. We want to make sure also that it, within the continent, th there are these value chains that to produce, to use uh, domestically, uh, to 
help with so many things, economic growth, job employment, but also to green our economies. I mean, that's, that's another way of greening uh, uh, our economies. Uh, and even for batteries. I mean, studies now is that batteries produced, produced locally in our, in our uh, countries are 30% uh, 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 cheaper. Uh, and it helps with what uh, Herr Excellency Commissioner Simpson said about diversification of the supply chain. Uh, and Africa is very well located, being at the center of the world, uh, to, uh, to do that. What is lacking, and what is lacking for all of us, actually, not just Africa? An innovative, also, business model. Innovative finance, because none of this happens at scale without proper finance. And if you look at the finance patterns around the world, they are still also still very traditional. So we need uh, 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 innovative uh, finance. Uh, 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 Africa receives 3% of you know, the energy investments in the world, only 3%, and none of it goes beyond generation. So uh, energy generation. So all of this has to change. We have to understand that energy is much more complex than just generation, and that innovation is driving this whole, for us, energy access and just transition for others is this transition, uh, and that, you know, this inter, I mean, twinning between the sectors uh, is important, including with the financial sector, and also the business model. For all of this to work together, we need an innovative uh, business model, which was alluded to, uh, 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 with, I mean, by uh, uh, dear Director General. Uh, so, it, it, things are beyond the connecting the last mile or innovating here or there. This, the whole ecosystem has to change and has to be adapted. It's tough for all of us and it's disrupting all of us, but it's a good disruption. Like what COVID, God forbid, I mean, it comes back, like what COVID represented to digitalization, major catalyst for digitalization. I think the current crisis is crisis because it's not just one crisis is a major driver uh, also and uh, catalyst for all of us to get out of this, as I said, comfort zone and, and do things differently and better. Thank you. And okay. Go ahead, go no, ahead. No, no. Go ahead. <laughs> Please interrupt everybody. No, no, it's, a, it's a, 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 and one of the, I mean, business models that uh, talk about that, for instance, uh, for us at the African Union, we are developing a master plan for energy use of the continent as a continent, not just as a country, uh, as a continent, uh, in order to uh, connect and trade energy across the continent. So our hope is that by 2040, we have an African, uh, a single African energy market. So as to bridge the gaps, use all the innovations and, and, and work as a continent, not just as a, uh, as a country or region, uh, especially that we are fabulously endowed, I mean, all uh, sources of energy. Thank, yeah, the, thank you, Commissioner, and uh, thank you for mentioning the Continental Master Plan. We, Arena supports uh, EU on this one. Thank you, thank uh, you for making Germany, us part of it. Yeah. The EU is a uh, major partner, of it's course. A, it's a very interesting project. I want to bring in my Director General here because you said something uh, that I know uh, is very close to his heart, that the financing institutions have to innovate as well. Uh, so, Director General, you know, we're talking about the huge infrastructure projects that need to um, um, be built out uh, on the continent. And uh, we know that public money is not enough uh, to deliver what needs to be delivered. So how do you see this public, uh, public funds being used cleverly to incentivize private finance? Well, first, uh I think that uh, I, I, I wish to make an effort to frame this, this discussion. And uh, I think that uh, Dr. Navarre has put us in the, in the context of this top tech exercise. So why I, I mention this? I mention this because uh, uh, the world will recognize that we are not on track. And uh, that we have to speed up and scale up our, our path, okay? So also innovation is going in this context. Because I, I always try to insist on the fact that uh, uh, time is the most important variable in, a, in, a, in this discussion on climate change. It's the only thing that counts, is time. 
So also innovation come in this context. So perhaps you remember that a couple of years ago, someone said that uh, the 50% of the technologies that we need was not yet there. No? Do you remember that? Uh, naturally, this was a, a, a fake question because the technologies are there. So what are the innovation? The innovation are in the context of the technologies that we have today, the way to make a better use of them. And this also applies in, in, in the innovation of uh, the market design and also in the building of what we need. So what we are insisting, I think this is what Elizabeth wanted me to say, is that so we have to, 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 to hurry up in the building of the infrastructure that we need. We are talking about the physical infrastructure and also the other. I tell you a very uh, uh, small story that is nice to, 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 to mention. We have been uh, in, the, in the EUE uh, house in, uh, in New York discussing uh, in, uh, with, uh, with uh, a few countries, many countries, uh, about the transition and, and they say how the US can uh, can hope that they can run faster if their grid system is so obsolete. Uh, and there was a, a, some representative of, of the US there say that it was uh, John Kerry and say, Francesco, you are not right. Our system is not obsolete. It doesn't exist. Uh, I wanted to be kind say obsolete, but uh, the fact that it really <laughs> doesn't exist. So how we can do this? Uh, so it's very urgent because uh, the old system has been built and supported in a hundred of years. And inevitably also this, our move to a new energy system based on renewables, complemented by hydrogen, mainly green and sustainable biomass will happen. But the question is, will happen in time? always refer to the, to the attention of, uh, of the Commission how all the potential of uh, the North Sea or the Baltic Sea of winds is not connected to Europe. And say because it's not only the question of Africa, it's also the question of the developed country that uh, something has to be done. But now we con I concentrate on, on, on the, uh, the developing world, so I respond the way uh, Elizabeth wanted me to respond. Because uh, <coughs> I, 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 I always f uh, fail, uh, say follow orders. So she wants to me say something that is very close to my heart. And this is the fact that uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, in uh, speeding up our path, we have to also rewrite the way international cooperation works. So if you want Africa to join the group, the multilateral financial institution has to take care of it. And this is a message that we are sending every day, every day until we will have at the COP28 declaration that the, uh, the member states recognize that the multilateral financial system should be work on that. As uh, uh, has been able uh, the, the system to work for Europe after the Second World War. Because if Europe is where it is now, it's because we have received loans for 50 years, two, two degree, two percent, and also the clause, if we were not able to, to repair, there was no problem. So why this not happen to Africa? Why this not, uh, it must be this effort to take Africa, Southeast Asia as a priority. They need to receive from the Western world, for the developed world, what they need in terms of infrastructure. Because it's in our interest. It will be, means decentralize the supply chain, it means that we can also work for building the green industry in the developing world. So we also decentralize the supply, all the supply chain and the added value also remain this country. Because development and the building of a new energy system, if this will happen, have to happen together. Thank, thank you very much, Director General. He said uh, what you wanted to hear. <laughs> I will speak to him after. <laughs> Uh, let me go back to Commissioner Simpson. You know, I was listening to, uh, uh, to a commissioner from California when he mentioned a blackout. I was like a little bit nervous about this. So uh, you, you are going very rapidly from the base load, traditional base load into flexible systems. Can you tell us a little bit how you are, what are the concerns that you have on the way and how you're innovating to prevent what happened in California? Yes. <laughs> 
Well, indeed, um, I was mentioning earlier that we are upgrading all our um, legislation, and one of these uh, pieces of legislation is uh, electricity market design. But do we, we do have a solid uh, regulation in place already. And last year, when Europe also faced like extreme uh, difficulties in our energy market as such, we lost 40% uh, of the um, natural gas supply, and uh, gas was necessary to balance uh, the moments when there was a peak demand and, uh, and uh, renewables were not available. So we were under extreme pressure. And, uh, and uh, last summer we also faced a, a situation where our hydro reservoirs were extremely low. And, uh, and on top of that there were unplanned maintenance works uh, in several nuclear power plants. And despite of that, we had no risk for blackouts because our electricity market design um, delivered. So. Um, there is a demand that, uh, that data will be shared uh, real time, and that sends also very strong messages um, and signals to our consumers. So um, we understand that uh, consumer side flexibility actually helps us to save a lot. And uh, one of the emergency measures that was agreed between 27 governments was to um, shave the peak hours also in the electricity market. Um, so if we can cut demand at the peak hours, that meant that uh, we were also able to, well, to save um, uh, gas, because uh, we did not uh, need so much uh, power generation from gas uh, power plants. What we're doing now, uh, we, uh, we need um, to strengthen the investment signals to storage. And uh, this is a very significant part of our electricity market design review. And, uh, and of course, we need to digitalize, uh, because only digitalization allows us uh, in the very near future um, to, uh, to promote um, flexibility in, uh, in electric vehicle charging, so um, uh, smart charging, smart heating, other devices that could be uh, switched on at the moment when electricity is uh, available at abundant volumes. And uh, this is what we are, we are doing. On top of that, it is very important to send clear signals to the future project promoters where to find um, the grid which is um, allowing additional um, power generation um, um, to come online. And uh, this has already triggered some uh, very innovative and interesting uh, solutions, for example, um, floating uh, solar that covers our hydro reservoirs. It uh, protects hydro reservoirs from evaporation, but at the same time, these solar panels are installed somewhere where already a strong grid connection existing. Um, and, uh, and then uh, Francesco was mentioning that uh, we really do plan that uh, European powerhouse will be in offshore, in North Sea and Baltic Sea. And for that, of course, we need to build up, uh, build, uh, build uh, um, well, um, subsea cables to connect electricity production where it is produced to the, um, to the consumer um, regions where it will be consumed. But on top of that, we will also create energy islands. So uh, um, these are the uh, windmills. Uh, one windmill can cover as um, as big demand as 10,000 households. Uh, but this is also a wonderful site where you can produce green hydrogen. And that means that we are already working uh, on build up of uh, hydrogen backbone infrastructure. Thank you, Commissioner. And let me stay with Commissioner Gunther for, for a moment, uh, because both of you talked about demand, emerging a peak demand, but you kind of need people to be part of it, aren't they? They're not combined standards. So how do you incentivize, uh, what is the innovation around the population engagement in energy management? Yeah, um, thank you. I think uh, just kind of building off uh, of the Commissioner here, uh, I think the, the big piece uh, to think through first on the energy management, right, the demand side management, is, is kind of like looking at the opportunity and, and which ones you could trigger easily and which ones you can't. So, for example, last year um, on September 6th, uh, you know, one of my core responsibilities as a commissioner is reliability, so that's all I think about. So I remember <laughs> the dates and the time and when I'm sweating. <laughs> so I, I, do, I do have that. So on last year, September 6th, we had an incredible amount of demand, the largest demand we've seen in California. Um, do you know why? 
yeah, it's it's late evening um, okay. episodes. I Have just wanted to kind of, TV. no, no. Uh, so, <laughs> so I just wanted to comment on that one because you know you just talked about um, solar deployment. So California has has been very successful in deploying solar. Um, we have about 14, 15,000 megawatts, large amount of solar deployment. That's, you know, that's just on the bulk side. Uh, on, on the top of that, we have another 10,000 megawatts on the, you know, behind the meter. So you have a large amount of solar uh, that's already deployed. Our problem right now in California is coming the net peak time, right? So the net peak is you take the demand, remove all the solar and wind generation, and see what, else de what other demand do you have left over, right, to, to carry through. So most of our demand comes late in the evening. Um, the air conditionings are still running, um, but we have our solar just ramped out. So in, in about a couple of hours, we lost 10,000 megawatts of solar, and the wind hasn't come up. And you have this evening period between 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. that's incredibly hard for us to manage, manage that load. So one of the things we can obviously do is bring resources that are geographically diverse, so we can go from California all the way to Wyoming or Montana, like two states away. The wind there will come early enough so we can pick it up. But we, the problem we have with that right now is the transmission lines that come are also a barrier, right? So uh, going back 2021, uh, July 19th, we had 4,000 megawatts of transmission line just gone like that because of fire. So you have these issues where you know, you have to do something with the demand side. So coming to your point, um, what we have been trying to innovate on is look at how can you incentivize and what incentive levels actually make sense. So we look at two types of um, uh, kind of demand side management opportunities. One is behavior driven, and one is driven largely with an asset. So if you're looking at behind the meter storage, you're looking at a large equipment, these are assets you could turn off, and then so the, the opportunity and performance from that is real. But if you think about people turning off their air conditioning, or turning off their fans or computers, it's, it's highly unreliable. So what we're testing right now is, let us make sure we can connect them as well as we can, develop rate design, but our biggest innovation right now is paying large amounts of incentives. So right now we are paying about $2,500 a megawatt hour. Um, so for you know, somebody turning off at a home, it'll probably translate to $10, $15 of support. And, and we're still testing it. I think we're still not getting the response we would like to on the behavior side. But as long as the, it's with the asset, like the behind the meter, which can turn into a virtual power plant, you have a lot better response. So I think the innovation is both on looking at rate design, telemetry, as well as incentive framing. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, very interesting. Can I go back to Palau? Because uh, one of the things that the Director General mentioned, uh, the stock take and, uh, and NDCs, you also mentioned NDC. So one of the things that we found out in the first round of NDCs that uh, 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 small island developing states, states were the first ones who actually positioned adaptation in context of energy. Now it's becoming a little bit mainstream, but you were really innovated some pioneers in that. So how do you look at this side of uh, adaptation side, and how do you see the energy transition linked to the adaptation side? Thank you for that question. It's really relevant to us. And uh, before I answer that, if, if I can just say, you know, in listening to the conversations, you know, we're all talking about the same thing, mm -hmm. and they're all applicable to us in different ways. So I think it's, it's uh, really important to have these sorts of engagements where we can share and, and learn and connect, uh, because I think that's a big part of the solution in solving, you know, the bigger picture. Uh, and it has to be done together um, as a system, uh, as I've heard today. Uh, but the... Uh, energy transition for our country and this administration uh, in charge of uh, Palau at this point has recognized that energy is a uh, fundamental, critical focal, focal point uh, for climate change adaptation. And uh, it touches on every sector and, and uh, you know, everyone's lives equally. Um, and it's all interrelated. So um, we, f we felt uh, very early on that, that we need to, to at least have a voice and uh, 
make it very clear that this is a very important area for us. We've been widely outspoken, uh, most recently at the UN uh, General Assembly, uh, with our president speaking for an extended period of time, um, including talking about you know, this point about the climate change and everybody needs to do their part. I think that also applies um, internally. You know, all of us need to do our part and there's different parts that we have to focus on. In our case, uh, energy uh, and climate change goes down to a, a very community uh, level type of engagement. So messaging is also highly critical internally as much as it is uh, abroad having everyone say the same message uh, locally and domestically, regionally, is something that um, we really do want to promote. But I think it's, it's really important also to, to recognize that uh, the Pacific, in particular, is going to be the first to, to feel the pain of climate change. So we don't have time, as the Director General said. We have to act. Uh, it's an imperative. So this is the way that uh, we decided we need to engage and uh, for us, uh, for our region and, and for everyone, uh, because it is a global challenge. So I think we've, we've taken that approach and I think that's the initiative that we moved on. Energy more recently has been, uh, as I said earlier, really a, a challenge for us. Uh, but we have to design uh, policy and systems, hardware, software, to all align for the future and be mindful that things may not turn out. Uh, the way you expect, some of your plans may have to be adjusted, and that flexibility that moving away from legacy systems instead of replacing uh, diesel gen sets and uh, converting over to renewables and having the utility move from a power generator to a power manager, you know, and, and demand side management is very, very critical uh, to all of this, especially for us in the Pacific who are very focused on tourism as, and a very narrow economic base and small uh, economies with a limited scale. Uh, we have to be really smart in approaching this. Fortunately, we have a lot of good friends like Irina that are helping us uh, with this challenge and we have to be just brazen and bold in, in approaching this problem because it does uh, mean a lot for us. Um, so, uh, just some thoughts on, on our yeah. position with uh, NDCs. Thank, thank you so much, and thank you for pointing out that we are all on the learning curve. Uh, so the exchange in this uh, setting from a diverse setting is really, really important. Um, I want to go to Mr. Now, uh, the, there was a mention of green hydrogen a few times, but we didn't really go there. So Belgium has a, a mission on green hydrogen. How, how are you going about it? How, how do you consider yourself in the in the global uh, shift towards green hydrogen? Uh, yes, of course, hydrogen is a very important part of the solutions. We spoke uh, before of all solutions which had to be uh, mobilized uh, to, together and, and for the future. And um, in Belgium, we had a, a first strategy uh, decided in, uh, uh, in 2021 um, with different uh, pillars and certainly uh, for uh, being, uh, deciding for being uh, a hub in a hub position for hydrogen um, for different reasons. We, we, we have uh, some companies which are, we have lead, leadership on, the, that, uh, on that sector. We have also um, some ports like uh, uh, Antwerp port, of course, which is a very uh, well positioned. Uh, and um, we have uh, also uh, pipelines which are, uh, which are already uh, existing but, but which have to be developed in the, in the following uh, years. We have uh, some uh, milestones for 2026 with the uh, National Recovery and Resilience Plan and then we go to 2030 uh, to interconnect uh, industry uh, in Belgium on the backbone and also to the, um, the other countries uh, in the neighbour. Um, we, th we think there are three different routes uh, to, to Belgium. The, the, the north uh, route, which, which is connected to uh, the, um, the big uh, production of offshore uh, electricity, which can uh, uh, produce uh, some hydrogen uh, with not too many costs, and then, of course, have uh, some, some production and distribution from, from the ports. Then we have 
uh, the south route uh, more uh, to uh, North Africa and uh, in the continent, but that needs, of course, um, more investments uh, on, the, on the pipes. Uh, and then we have also the ship's routes for uh, molecule transport of uh, renewable uh, molecules and, and hydrogen, uh, which can also uh, provide other uh, appliances. So it's a very important development for the next year. And for my region in Wallonia, we are preparing now um, in discussion with all the actors, public actors, uh, investors, and so on, a strategy uh, specific for, for Wallonia, uh, which, is, which will be based on uh, research, innovation, of course. I think it's a major subject for innovation uh, around the world, um, and on infrastructure and um, organization of the market. So uh, it, it's a very important subject for the following years for us, for us and I think for everybody, as I can see uh, and hear in the different speeches uh, around the world. Yeah, thank you very much. And obviously, it's not just a, a, a necessary element of the new energy system, but also the economic diversification that comes around that. And let me go back to, actually, just for all of you to think, I, th I think in the round, last round, we have, a, we have a few more minutes, but in the last round, I would want you to, to tell us if you had your wish, like what would be one innovation that you think is really missing that, that can make a difference? So think a little bit about that. We're going to do another round of discussion. I, I want to go back to, to you, Commissioner Abzaid. Um, so the economic aspect of it, and like we just concluded that you just concluded the first uh, climate summit in Africa, and green industrialization was really a big topic. And how do you see these two strategies of advancing simultaneously? Well, uh, industrialization and the African free trade area. Uh, these are the two themes that uh, for us are very highly important, and none of them works without energy, of course. So whatever we're saying here, I mean, about access to electricity, but also electricity at scale, uh, and not just the, 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 the electricity well, for remote area, electricity at scale and affordability of, uh, of this electricity are critical for either industrialization or the African free trade area. And this comes only from innovation. Innovation in generation, innovation transmission, innovation in efficiency. Uh, and, and this is why discussions or uh, uh, meetings like this one are very critical to, uh, to the ambitions of the, uh, of the African Union. And let me um, highlight here uh, the importance of uh, cross-border uh, technical collaboration. Uh, it's very exciting to be on this panel. Uh, I, I go back to, to that COVID year. Uh, COVID, during COVID, if you all remember the conversation, it was said that never before we've seen collaboration across borders, you know, between scientists uh, like under COVID, because everyone was, you know, focused on uh, tackling the crisis. Now, we're not seeing necessarily the same thing happening when it comes to the energy and the climate crises. Uh, so whether it's finance, whether it's technical expertise, whether it's technology transfer and, and skills, I think we all have to see that there's, these are serious crises. They are very much upon us. Uh, things, very bad things are happening around the world, and they are increasing. They're becoming more severe and more frequent. And I'm calling also for this uh, uh, cross-border uh, 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 technology uh, uh, transfer, expertise, capacity building, which, which is going to be critical for any of our plans, whatever our plans are. Uh, and in the case of Africa, our industrialization program or our uh, uh, African free trade area to, uh, to, to really happen and to respond to our ambitions, especially that for us, we are the, also the fastest growing uh, a continent in terms of region, in terms of uh, population. So uh, uh, innovation and cross-border collaboration, technology transfer, so it's not just about selling again to the developed world, whatever is now really collaborating, and I did mention the creating the local value chains are going to be critical for this to happen. Thank you, Commissioner. Let me go to Commissioner Simpson. Uh, Europe actually has done really well in the regional 
market integration, what are some of the lessons you, you can actually share with others from your experience, political and regulatory? Indeed, our um, energy markets are relatively well interconnected. And saying so, we still have one member state who is not connected with the rest of the mainland Europe, so we are investing a lot to, uh, to connect the last remaining uh, island, that is Cyprus, also with the rest of the European Union. But, uh, but um, saying so, our electricity uh, network is uh, going beyond uh, the borders of the European Union. So we are connecting uh, one by one our neighbours. Um, and I think that the, one of the best examples how big is the role of uh, interconnected electricity market and what different it makes uh, was visible last autumn when Russia started to uh, target um, Ukraine's civil energy infrastructure. Um, so um, every week, uh, civil uh, grid installations, um, um, power plants were under missile attacks, and only this, due to the fact that uh, Ukraine was interconnected with the rest of the Europe, um, they avoided lasting blackouts. Um, we are also uh, working towards other neighbours, and, uh, and there are several um, projects um, um, at this um, initial phase, also connecting Europe with um, our partners in Northern Africa, um, just to mention a few, Tunisia and uh, Egypt. And of course, uh, the distances are relatively long. Um, we need subsea cables, um, uh, which are also necessary to connect uh, offshore wind farms. So that's one of the reasons why in our net zero industry act, we also covered Creed um, components, because um, we understand we have to invest a lot into the uh, grid connections. Bigger electricity markets uh, bring benefits to all our societies and can accommodate more renewables. And, and overall, um, we just had um, a couple of weeks ago the big super grid event in Brussels where we um, shared uh, the analysis that by the end of this decade we have to invest 600 billion euros to upgrade our grids to achieve our target that uh, um, that uh, out of our energy consumption, 42.5 will be covered by renewables and well, well, it is easier to electrify than to use other renewable sources. So um, we need um, massive investments, but keeping in mind how much we paid for imported fossil fuels, it, it makes sense. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, I guess it's the same for you. Huh? There's a huge upgrades to be done, and uh, you're also looking at uh, electric mobility with trucking, and so that, that's growing demand. So how do you think that this can be reconciled, this investment in infrastructure versus continuous in innovations and what's going to come your way? Yeah, um, I think you know, the Director General talked about, um, I think we have the necessary technologies for most part, right? I mean, I think, in, in California, we keep saying this is the age of great implementation. Um, we just have to you know, really commit to building the necessary um, upgrades in a new infrastructure. So we're talking about uh, one, distribution upgrades, right? Large amount of distribution upgrades. Um, our initial kind of estimate for distribution upgrades is about $30 billion of new investment that we need to do uh, to make sure the demand could be a good part of the, part of the grid. On the top of that, you know, again, Director General talked about the transmission, <laughs> lack of transmission this morning. Um, California has good amount of transmission, but we need to start connecting to the rest of the West better. Um, and that, that is seen uh, through another lens of another $20, $30 billion. So we are looking at you know, a solid $50 to $75 billion worth of new investments necessary just bring the uh, infrastructure up. So in, in terms of um, then kind of how do we do that, there are two elements I, I just wanted to elevate because we haven't as a team um, discussed this. When we talk about the clean energy transition, um, it's clean, it's reliable, affordable, but more of it is equitable, right? Like we talk about equity. California is 40 million people um, and it's the home of 100 federally recognized tribal nations. So a very uh, diverse population. And for, for us to be able to do the necessary innovations through the lens of equity that everybody's coming along together is really hard. Um, not everybody wants to build in California. 
Um, and every, I mean, we want to retire our, our resources uh, that are fossil, which are largely in low-income areas. So when we talk about retiring large amount of fossil generation but not be able to build, right? So it creates this problem of how do you ensure that this 60, 70 billion dollars worth is actually invested in a way that all local economies raise together. And whether we talk about uh, employment opportunities, whether it is uh, having the necessary air quality that's equal to everybody, that has been the challenge. So for us in California, in this great period of implementation, the biggest challenge and innovation for us is really around making sure communities feel like they're a part of this transition and bringing their ability to take control of, of their communities and the state being able to support the investment necessary to bring everybody along. So that's the struggle we're in. It's not a dearth of technology, not a dearth of money. It's really about how do we make it equitable in a transition for all. Yeah, thank you for bringing out that important point and that yeah, like energy is no longer something that somebody else deals with, it's actually everybody's business. Um, we talked quite a bit about electricity, we talked quite a bit about uh, transport, but I would just like to touch upon buildings a little bit and maybe, uh, maybe we can start with you, Minister. Uh, so, I mean, you mentioned that, that tourism is one of the major, uh, major economic activities on the island and, uh, and the cooling is an enormous part of that. So with climate change, the needs for cooling are increasing, but also there's a lot of innovation around that. How do you see that impacting your, uh, your own policy making? Thank you for that question. Tur tourism is, is so central, and we found out in, uh, during COVID how central that was, and basically wiped out our, our main industry and set us back many, many years with uh, having to borrow money just to maintain government operations and civil order. Uh, as well as maintaining infrastructure so that we could have a private sector um, once there is a rebound. That rebound has been slow in coming. But uh, these sort of vol volatile environment, you know, does encourage innovation and, and action on the part of our tourism uh, participants. Uh, and we've seen them invest in uh, uh, better efficiency in uh, building uh, methods so that the demand is, is not as great. And we've seen them uh, use uh, efficient measures of lighting and, and uh, maybe better ventilation, better design and the layout of the property. So that encourages uh, a lot more uh, resilience and, and less need for electrification. Uh, cooling has, has been a challenge, so we've outlawed uh, certain gases uh, for certain refrigerants. Uh, to be used in uh, air-conditioned units uh, locally. Uh, and they have been quick to adopt because they've had to. Uh, we've, we've been fortunate that we follow the United States very closely. A lot of our appliances are from the United States and, and they're often already energy efficient uh, through that code uh, that we've adopted just by our purchasing arrangements. But uh, don't forget that uh, for tourism, uh, heating is also just as equally important. Uh, after a long day in, in the tropical waters on some beach, remote beach, or diving, seeing all of our undersea residents, uh, sea life that we have in Palau, people want to take a shower. And often it's a hot shower. So uh, we've seen our tourism uh, market invest in solar water heating, uh, for instance. And uh, cooling and heating are very expensive. and. It's hard to turn a profit when you have such a volatile market. So uh, you do want to lower your, your cost structure on an operating basis. So uh, we've seen our, our tourism sector um, really buy into uh, the message because they understand and how it affects them on, a, on the bottom line. The government has been uh, very proactive in trying to support them as well. Uh, come next year, we will have a new innovative financing product to provide uh, PV to SMEs. Uh, and this is something that I think we're really excited about. Uh, we're also looking at uh, a way to uh, invest in uh, V2G, especially with water vessels for some of our remote communities. That, that means a lot. Uh, also in digitalization so that we don't need for um, our remote uh, businesses in the diving areas, uh, those islands surrounding those areas, 
uh, to have to spend money to come to the, the main island to do their shopping or pay their bills or taxes. So we're looking at that as a, also an, an engagement to lower the cost of business. And, and I think uh, they're, they're looking forward to these innovations and programs and are, are just waiting for us to approve them. Some, some of them are, are new technology. We are piloting a, a stable coin uh, to help with digitalization and e-government, e e-commerce. Uh, these are very sensitive uh, matters for some of our partners, uh, and we have to approach it cautiously and make sure we, we don't endanger uh, our financial system as well as our partners' financial systems. Th thank you. I was going to ask about heating the uh, minister from Belgium. <laughs> so, uh, Balkan. More eating More than, than cooling, cooling yes, but it's true. coming, no? <laughs> uh, but the bulk of the heating in Europe is fossil fuel dependent. So what are the innovations that you have to both incentivize more away from fossil fuels, but also new technologies to being deployed? Uh, yes, it's, those are of course big, uh, big change to 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 do. So we are, we are in the European uh, system where we have uh, um, uh, big issues for the industry, which are decided at the European level. And in our responsibility, we have to manage uh, the transformation of uh, buildings, uh, heating buildings, uh, and uh, and efficiency in buildings. And of course, the mobility, uh, the mobility. And um, for buildings, we we have now um, um, decided uh, uh, certain steps up to 2030 and then 2050, um, so that uh, we will um, insulate much uh, buildings, of course, and then going uh, through other energies. If we have uh, buildings well insulated, you. you you may uh, use uh, easier electricity to, to uh, heat the building. Um, then we have also other solutions like biomass. We have also uh, many innovation now on um, uh, eating uh, sharing. I, I didn't, don't know, don't know the word exactly in English more anymore, but I mean uh, recuperating, wasting the, the lost uh, heat from industry and sharing it with other industries or with uh, habitations uh, or communities. Uh, so I, I think uh, an important solution is in sharing energy, electricity or heat. Uh, and um, that's changed, of course, much the way of living, organizing the market and, uh, and uh, to, to organize the, the heating or, or the, the, or the, the different uh, needs. Um, and of course, we have to increase our production of renewables so that we are able to, um, to have the, the production needed for more electrification. We know we will have more electrification. Uh, of course, we have to work a lot on uh, efficiency, also on uh, sobriety, so that we have less energy needed, and it's uh, the, perhaps the most difficult. Efficiency, that is innovation and technology. Sobriety, it's changing our way of living or our way of uh, uh, different uh, needs that we have now. So it's something uh, difficult. And uh, then we have more electricity, and we can also organize more communities uh, for sharing electricity, we are making that now. We have the, the legal system now, so that we organize the, the consumption of the electricity at the time it is produced, at locally. And that is virtual, virtual communities, electrical uh, virtual communities at local uh, grid, at local uh, level, so that we don't have to make uh, very big investments to transport electricity further or eventually uh, uh, organize the, the storage. So it's major things that we try to do, <laughs> like in other countries, because it's a, a big uh, change we have to do in the following years. Thank you. Please. Yes, I would like to speak to that, please. I mean, because you raised a very important point that unfortunately does not get the same attention as heating, which is cooling. And for us in the continent, cooling is extremely needed and extremely important. Not only the, I mean, the scorching heat, I mean, the, uh, and it's increasing. 
but also uh, for our health systems, for our health care. I mean, uh, many of the vaccines, for instance, for, for COVID were thrown away simply because we could not okay. use them for lack of, uh, of cooling systems. This is how critical uh, uh, cooling is. And we're seeing the, the conversation, the efforts, and, uh, and the attention is being given to, uh, to heating, I understand, of course, for, for Europe as a matter of survival, but it's also as a matter of survival for us. We need, uh, in the continent, we do need cooling, so uh, we cannot uh, uh, stress enough the importance of cooling and uh, the need for it to have the equal attention uh, as in terms of innovation and uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of technological breakthrough as, as we, uh, we do with, the, uh, with heating. Uh, also, the issue of buildings, and, and yes, that's a very valid question because until now, I mean, most of our buildings are not energy efficient and uh, uh, are not making use, again, of the technology. And I dare say uh, uh, we should be from our region, back to the future. Our traditional building material, our traditional architecture was energy efficient and cooling inside. Uh, it's when you adopt uh, uh, materials and or architecture that is not uh, necessarily, you know, um, uh, uh, how would you say it? Fit for conventional. I mean, that, that you go into, into directions that you do not want. And I'm very proud to say, and it's not, that's not because I'm, a, uh, I'm an Egyptian, I'm very proud to be Egyptian, but because it's the largest on the continent and almost the largest in the world. I'm very happy to see the program called Decent Life in Egypt, where they are committed to do three things. Connecting all rural households, that's 60 million people, by the way, uh, with high-speed fiber. Uh, uh, connecting the, all of them to turn into uh, clean cooking. And also rethinking the architecture in ways to be uh, energy efficient. And this is happening within three years, and they already, you know, done this for 3,000 villages. That's, that's massive. And we've not seen this scale and this kind of a, a transformational efforts happening except maybe in China or something. So I would like also again to commend the many efforts in, in our continent to do massive things, as I said, I mean at a scale that has not been maybe applied other, uh, uh, elsewhere in the world. So just to emphasize issue of infrastructure, issue, uh, uh, sorry, buildings, uh, efficiency, cooling, cooling is as important and also urging everyone in their innovation to think and rethink our traditional material and architecture. Yeah, it just emphasizes also the importance of innovation in different settings for mm -hmm. different reasons. I mean, you emphasize also the, the diversity that you have. So I think, and it's our job also cut out for us to, to pick up all of this and put it in an innovation toolbox and make it available for everybody to read. Uh, Director General, would you like to reflect on what you have heard and how do you think Karina can take this forward. You know, uh, I feel the need to be a little bit naive. Okay, please go ahead. And uh, <laughs> to build on uh, what uh, our California colleague just said, you know. When I was working in my Ministry of Environment in Italy, I, I was called uh, to write regulation, drafting law. And they were saying all, uh, always to my people, when we are write a decree, we have to think about uh, writing a, a song. Uh, doesn't mean that they have to, 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 to use the guitar, but the fact that I, I wanted uh, uh, them to, to, to think is that so we, are, we are not writing something neutral, but something that was going to affect the people. You know? So what is the most important innovation that we can, uh, we can ask for? that there is always, in our decision-making, a sense of justice. So if, when are innovating, we think about reducing the existing inequalities in the world, I think the innovation will come very easy. That's excellent. And quick round. What's missing? Um, I'll just go back to the theme of demand flexibility. 
Um, I think in California for 10, 15 years, we have been investing um, in demand flexibility. We have had only partial success um, because we don't have a good holistic approach of the necessary controls and telemetry married with the rates and incentives. So I think given how much we're electrifying, given the opportunity to vehicle to grid, the buildings, the load management standards we are gonna have, I think demand flexibility is the key uh, for, for decarbonizing, so. Commissioner Sipson. Digitalization is also very important for us, but I would uh, like to add also large um, uh, storage because uh, we see um, big losses due to the fact that we cannot save um, wind energy at the moment when we have abundant uh, wind uh, at our disposal or, or the same goes with solar. So yes, there is piping hydro, there are some batteries, but um, we need, uh, we need uh, lots of innovation still at that, uh, that uh, sector. Where I would like to see innovation most is in the storage space to be much more efficient, to be much smaller, more affordable, and more importantly, least disruptive uh, and distractive to uh, our livelihoods in Africa and to our mines and to our minerals on the continent, so, and even the oceans, because they are also harvesting the oceans, so uh, that is storage that is not disruptive, distractive, and much more efficient, affordable, and smaller in size. Thank you. Mr. Ahoy. Yes, I think we have also uh, certainly to think about justice also for the people, between rich and poor people, between according to the situation of everybody. Uh, we won't have a transition if we don't take into account all the people. And for example, flexibility, uh, displacing of the demand, I think it's a very important subject. But then we have to have technological systems and different possibilities for the people individually so that it's possible for, for them to do that and to help the, the, the general network. Minister Underway. Maybe if I, if I reflect on this question, I, I, I would say if there's one thing that we should focus on uh, for the Pacific Islands as well as the, with my other finance ministers in the Vulnerable 20, I think we have to have a change, a shift in, in thinking of, uh, of the problem of who it's being affected. Uh, and you know we we are very strongly promoting the uh, change in in the way of looking at us, not just one single variable of GNI per capita, but a, on a multi-dimensional vulnerability uh, way of looking at the Pacific and this challenge of climate change and energy transition, uh, which would open up a lot of resources, uh, tech, technology that uh, could be brought to the problem that we're facing uh, right now. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your wonderful contributions. I'm really happy that we heard this so many diverse views from different parts of the world, but also different settings, different mindsets. And uh, that was a perfect scene setter for next week and discussions we will have. And uh, everybody, please remember that no one solution fits all and uh, all the tasks that we have gotten from, uh, from the participants telling us what we need to innovate, but maybe by the end of this week, we'll find some of these solutions. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, can you just stay for the picture, the panel? I will love it. This is a very gender balanced Thank panel. Much, uh, Thank you, uh, as always. Thank you. As always, you should be in the middle. men on that side, women on that side. No, This could be good. Why not? Can you, can you, can you, thank you. you see what I have to do? Here we go. <laughs> do you want to go in the middle? Yes, I will. And I will, I will come to the side. Oops, probably pull my pants down. <laughs> Let me give you my, my notes so that I can share them with yes, you since I didn't send them. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but Roland should come up as well. Don't look at others. <laughs> Wonderful.
Thank you all very much. That's the best. If everybody would just settle for a moment, I would like to invite Roland Rush to... One of the things we all know is at the heart of what we're talking about at Innovation Week is innovation, and that's in finance, in policy, in technology. And that's actually what Roland is going to talk to us about now with the poster exhibition, one of the things that lies at the heart of what we're trying to do with Innovation Week. Roland? Yes, many thanks for this excellent panel. Many thanks, Felicia. I would like to take the opportunity and draw to your attention to our poster session here on stage. Irina places great emphasis on the importance of ideas of young minds. Irina has therefore organized an innovators contest to showcase the best project to this audience of experts. The responsible innovators and startups behind these posters up here to share more about their innovative ideas. Um, we extend our, our dear gratitude to the United Arab Emirates for sponsoring these young innovators and making their present at Innovation Week possible. Our hope is that these young innovators can learn from experienced peers and experts how to take their projects from mere ideas to commercial scale solutions. Additionally, we are launching our smart electrification digital toolbox today. This toolbox stems from our innovation landscape report on smart electrification. Director General La Camera had also mentioned the toolbox for smart electrification in his opening speech. We have two screens for the follow. It's a practical tool that lets you explore the 100 innovations identified in the report and select those relevance to your country's context. I wish you lots of fruitful exchanges and also a bit of fun playing with the toolbox. And also I would like to emphasize here that we have infographics that try to summarize the events and you can find already here a first summary of the, the opening event here. Thank you very much. Enjoy the lunch break now. Thank you, everybody. And just so that you know, we're going to recommence at half past one. So I'd like you all to be here at half past one, if you could. It's Power Systems for the Future, and everyone is in this room for that session. Lunch is out in the cafeteria. If you go out the back, down to the left, left again, you'll find the cafeteria, and if that's a bit full, you can go through it to the marquee. Lots of finger foods, delicious lunch, and see you later.